So I'll introduce you to the people who I hope are going to help us all to be more informed this afternoon and help us on our journey. The first member of our panel is in fact not with us in the room, he's on uh, a, a, a video, and that is Dan Sherrard Smith. He's the founder of an organization called Mother Tree, and he's going to talk about the impact of banks, pensions, and other investments on climate and nature. Tom Beckett on my left, you've already met several times today. He's the brains behind this uh, whole wonderful festival. Uh, but among other things, he's an investor in impacts investments and abundance investments. And Tom's going to talk about ethical investment schemes, how you find them, and what risk and returns you can expect. And finally, Jeroen Hutzinger, who's a senior development manager from Ethex. And Jerome's going to talk about the importance of investing sustainably through the impact of Ethex's projects. So I'm very pleased that they're here this afternoon. And we're going to start off with a video from Dan Sherrod Smith. We'll get there in about 25 minutes. Uh, so Mother Tree, uh, our mission is to make it really easy for values-led businesses to go green and save money. We focus on finances, so uh, banks, pensions, investment, insurance, those kind of things. And I'd just like to start with why Mother Tree is called Mother Tree. We get asked this quite a lot. We get asked, is it called Money Tree? It's Mother Tree. And it's called, it's called this because of a brilliant scientist called Susan Simars from Canada. And she actually discovered that trees share nutrients. They communicate with each other, supporting each other in in old growth forests and the mother trees are the ones who, who sort of support the most and share the most and that's really our ethos we want to support and grow an ecosystem of values led businesses to to really thrive in in this world in terms of mother trees so i talked about our mission for values led businesses what we've done so far so we've saved the uk uh, consumers over 500 tons of carbon we've saved businesses far more than that we work with the likes of go cardless on their financial footprint They've actually put 30 billion through their banks annually, so it's a huge footprint there. We also work with leading charities in the US and the UK, and we've shifted over, uh, well, this needs to go way up actually, but we've, it's over 10 million now, but we've shifted over 10 million into the green economy. Uh, two founders, that's me on the left with my boy Theo, a little bit more about him later. He, he looks a bit older than that now, he's two and a half. And on the right uh, is Craig, my co-founder. Craig uh, has 10 years plus experience in professional services, he has uh, seven plus years of those experience at Bain & Co, so one of the leading consultancy firms. He really gets how to make change management really work in complex businesses. He's also a qualified accountant. He's the numbers guy, right? A lot, you'll see some numbers later on in this presentation. He's more of the numbers guy than me. I'm a bit of a spreadsheet geek, but he takes it to another level. Uh, and on my side, so my background, I was on the founding team of Look After My Bills. We had the best ever deal on Dragon's Den. We saved the British public. 127 million pounds in three years and we built the UK's biggest auto switching platform so we switched almost a million households uh, consistently and accurately on their energy bills year in year out um, when uh, when I look after my bills my son was born there he is Theo and it really made me question where I was spending my time I want to you know at some point he's going to grow up and he's going to ask me what did I do when I realized the extent of the climate crisis and I want to be able to say that all I could with the skills that I had and actually as we've, as we've explored this as we've conducted the interviews we you know it's much broader than just climate but that was my way in and uh, my way into this and my story goes back a little bit further so I grew up in Swansea in South Wales uh, it's got some beautiful beaches I like to say uh, well my wife says they're the best beaches in my world because I say they're the best beaches in the world. I'm obviously biased on that. Just a beautiful part of the world. And at 12 years old, I remember sitting in a geography lesson and hearing about climate change for the first time and realizing within my lifetime, without dramatic change, we were going to lose this, this part of the planet. That was my first wake up call. There's been many others more profound ever since, but that, that was the first. And so when my son was born, that was the kind of catalyst and and I left my, uh, my comfortable job. By then we'd established look after my bills to, to uh, a 25 million per year revenue business. Uh, I left it, didn't know what I was gonna do, but started exploring, started interviewing people in terms of their experience of the climate crisis. 
And it was my wife actually who came up with the idea of something called the climate challenge. The climate challenge back then, this is over two years ago now, was 30 actions over 30 days for groups of about eight people at a time. We ran five of them. We went vegan for the day. We got rid of single use plastic. We looked at our carbon footprints, lots of the standard stuff you know, that you hear businesses and individuals should, should be doing. But on two of the actions, it really caused the shock, me included. First time I went through the climate challenge, it was new for me. And I found out where my bank was investing. I was with First Direct, and I, who are owned by HSBC. And I found out where my pension was going. 2% of my pension was going to oil and gas, BP and Shell. 1% was going to British American tobacco, 1% to weapons just things that I'd never choose to invest in. And yet every month, some of my cash had been going there. And at the same time, I looked at look after my bills bank account. We were with Lloyd's. Lloyd's had put 12 billion pounds into oil and gas since 2016. So, you know, we're doing all this good saving people money, but actually it's kind of being eroded by having a bank that's investing in, uh, in the billions into oil and gas. So that's where we really focused our research and our efforts and our time to just understand what's going on in terms of our banks and in terms of our pensions. And we, we uncovered some, some pretty shocking results. So the UK's big five banks, traditional big five, that's Barclays, HSBC, Lloyds, NatWest, and Santander, and their affiliated brands like First Direct that I mentioned, and uh, you know Halifax for Lloyds, RBS for NatWest. These banks, these five banks, have put uh, 29 billion into oil and gas last year, just last year, hundreds of billions since 2016. And actually the world's 60 biggest banks, which includes those five, put 50 times more into fossil fuel expansion than the fossil fuel companies themselves. Just to put that another way, for every pound that BP and Shell put into expansion, the world's 60 biggest banks are putting in 50 pounds. You know, I think Bill McKibben, journalist, owner of um, 350.org, really sums this up. Money is the oxygen that keeps the fossil fuel industry burning. Without that money to expand, they'd have to change their business model pretty quickly. What we found was, therefore, for a business where we bank has a real impact. We looked at Google. Google have $130 billion in their accounts. It's a very nice problem to have. That, based on where those banks are investing, that cash has a carbon footprint. And that carbon footprint is actually twice as big as all of their other carbon emissions, including their supply chain, put together. It doubles their carbon footprint just by having the cash with certain banks. And what applies to Google applies to lots of other big brands that we've looked at. Apple, who did that brilliant video with Mother Nature a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it. I think it's fantastic. Tim Cook meeting Mother Nature and her holding uh, the, you know, that kind of senior team to account on what they're doing. They didn't mention their bank. Their bank, when you add in to that report, adds 3.9 times higher to their reported emissions. It's a huge difference to what Apple are doing and contributing. PayPal, you might have heard of PayPal. They move money from A to B. The money they hold, proportionate to all their other business activities, is, is immense. You know, much bigger than a company like Google and, and Apple in proportion to their other business activities. Well, their money accounts for 57 times. You know, when you add it into their reported emissions, it increases it by 57 times. And even a non-tech company, those three are, are you know, very much tech companies. Even a non-tech company like Johnson & Johnson, you probably use some of their shampoo from time to time. So when you add in their cash position based on their banks, it adds, it, it moves their reported carbon emissions by 1.2 times. We thought when we first saw this, well, this is just this is just the big brands. They hold lots of cash for acquisitions, etc. It's just the big big brands. You know, how does that apply to the average company? We focused on the UK, but our research increasingly shows that this applies worldwide. But using UK figures, the average UK company, based on ONS data, has about 10 employees and has a carbon footprint of about 75 tons. Now that you know, that's obviously a cross section of lots of industries. There are higher uh, emitting industries than other, but as an average in the UK, about 75 tons. And when you add in their bank, it adds another 75 tons. It's actually 0.1 higher than their entire emissions uh, for everything else. So that's a huge impact 
on a, on a you know just a typical company just like it has a big impact with google it's twice as big when you add in the bank to the reported emissions and and so this is you know where we really focused uh, on with mother tree but we also look at wider values i mentioned earlier carbon uh, emissions was my way in the climate crisis but when we started looking at these banks and hearing from clients we were compelled to go much further and it, it paints a pretty sorry picture for the big five uk banks you know we've seen barclays have put 6.7 billion into a company called jbs over the last six years jbs not to be confused with jls the band jbs are the world's biggest butcher they, they're actually responsible for 100,000 acres of deforestation between 2019 and 2021, and 75% of that was illegal deforestation. Barclays know that, and they continue to put about a billion a year into JBS. Matt West have been named by Ethical Consumer as funding cluster munitions and nuclear weapons. Barclays also named in that, but can't just bash Barclays, there are others doing this. And HSBC, who draw most of their revenue from China and Hong Kong, throws pro-democracy protesters' accounts in Hong Kong uh, you know, dur during China's crackdown on, on Hong Kong there. So they're facing human rights scandals. So you know, it goes much further than, than, just climate, than just climate change. It really gets to every facet of, of our society in terms of what this money's doing. And what applies to banks also applies to pensions. There's 37 trillion pounds in pensions in the world. That's about 7% of the global economy. That's a huge lever that we can pull to start to change the direction here. And the truth is, if you have a pension or if you're responsible for your employee's pension, then you have skin in this game in terms of where that money is going. And when we looked, we realized about 4 to 10%, depending on the source, of this money is going to oil and gas companies. That's about three, that's over three trillion pounds invested in oil and gas companies as a result of our pensions globally. Here in the UK, the leading UK pension providers continue to allow investment in oil and gas. In fact, they put 10 times more into bonds and equities issued by fossil fuel companies than they did into FTSE 350 clean energy stocks. It's a huge amount more going into oil and gas as a result. And for businesses, their choice of pension adds another significant chunk to their carbon footprint. You know, let's look at our hypothetical business again, 10 employees. It adds another 41 tons of carbon to the footprint. We think we're underestimating this. We don't want to ever want to overestimate things. We think we're underestimating this. Craig thinks this number should go up. So we might, you know, next time we do this, we might see this go up quite dramatically. But the truth is, you know, given all of this, We've also seen that 50% of CEOs are worried about the impact of climate change on their business in the next... Uh, we're fading Dan out because although he's got quite a lot more to say, I think that uh, does paint the terrible picture of the investment record from our banks and our pensions and where our money is actually going, especially if, like me, you are banking with one of those big five banks. I'm hoping our other two speakers will be able to uh, give us some ideas of how we can mitigate against that. So I'm going to turn next to, da to uh, Tom. <laughs> See you in a moment. Okay, Tom. So um, it's a real shame that Dan couldn't join us today. We've got problems with the internet here, but I've done quite a lot of research into the impact of money. and. There's some evidence out there which indicates the amount of impact from our money is equivalent to our own carbon footprint. And of course that's different for what age group you are, but there's a huge amount of money which is held in pensions. And just imagine the number of people which are drawing from pensions every year. Well, it's going to be probably 30, 20, 30% of the UK economy is drawing pensions and that means all of the money which is being driven to drive those pensions, let alone all of the money which we're putting into pensions at the moment, actually has this kind of carbon shadow involved with it. Um, now, the evidence is pretty, op it's pretty opaque. 
there's, I mean, there's some studies into this which kind of indicate that it's, it's around 12 tons per person in the UK. But I've kind of taken a kind of view on, on, on that when, when I came to the Net Positive Life app and, 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 and applied some, some, some logic to kind of think about, well, well, what could that actually be in terms of your carbon footprint? I think it probably works out at about 10% to about 13% of your kind of active carbon footprint. Um, but I, again, it's very different for different age groups. For those people who haven't got any money saved, there obviously isn't very much impact. But for those people who, you know, have got a lot of money in pensions, it's got a much bigger impact. And 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 therefore, what we choose to do with our money and who we bank with is is, is really important. Now, some of the things which um, Mother Tree have provided are very useful. They've provided a league table. They've given some indications of. Um, your carbon footprint according to an, inv an average investment of £10,000 and it ranges quite wildly according to what bank you're invested in and you know I'd say resources like that are really really helpful in terms of helping an individual make decisions about that. Now there's kind of two components to um, our lives, well a few components to our lives when it comes to money we have our bank we have our pension and we have the kind of active investments, which we can take ICEs and the such like. Um, now, I think banking's one thing. We put money in, we take money out. Um, and, uh, you know, some people don't hold that much money in banks, but some people do, um, depending on their behaviors. Um, but banks make a difference, and we can move banks. Uh, I think when it comes to something like pensions, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, because some people have employer pensions, some people have linked schemes. Um, I think for for me, um, I'm talking from my personal perspective, I decided to do something about this. Um, I, 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 unfortunately, I've, I've, I've jumped through quite a few jobs in my life, probably about five or six. I, mean, I held all these really annoying pots of pensions, and one of my friends had just become a pension advisor, um, uh, not pensions, but a financial advisor, and he said, oh, I'm just getting qualified, Tom, can we do a little bit of a kind of, you know, a session together, and I'll give you a bit of advice. And I said, great, okay, we'll do that. And and then he said, well, what if you were going to move your pensions, what would you move them in? And I said, well, look, it's like, no oil and gas. Like, that's absolutely fundamental to me. Um, and ideally, nothing with a massive agricultural impact. And it was actually just before COVID that he managed to consolidate all of my pensions and move them into impacts investments. Now, if you remember during that time, people lost quite a lot of money on their pensions. In fact, quite a lot of people had a big drop off on their pensions. Um, and what happened was, you know, there was a fall in the economy. Mine did exactly the reverse. Uh, maybe people lost 10 to 15% on their pensions. I gained something outrageous like it was 80% on my pension over a year. Now, I was very lucky in terms of the way in which it had moved, but the fact of the matter is I had invested in technology. So things like Zoom went up. You know, like I had a massive jump in my pension because people were starting to use remote technology. They were starting to use smart technology to be able to get around the COVID crisis. And obviously I thought it was fantastic because at the end of the year, I had a much bigger pension than when I had started. Um, and one of the things which I kind of came out of that was that actually investing in a kind of more diverse or, or portfolio which is sustainable, it's more resilient within economic markets. And, and certainly, I mean, Impacts has its ups and downs, but it was a pension fund which was designed very much to tackle issues around nature and climate um, and I still have interactions with them so you know if you've got a pensions advisor I mean one of the things I would say is look at telling them well can't we move money into impacts investments um, and they're very transparent about their actions they do a lot of good things and I have no concerns about the fact that my money has an impact on nature and climate in fact quite the reverse I'm helping fund the future economy. So I'm feeling great about that. The other thing I did a few years ago because I sold my business and we consolidated a few bits and pieces was that I, 
I was looking out for kind of active, maybe slightly higher risk investments. Um, so I stumbled across, I mean, we came across ethics as well, but I also came across abundance investments. Um, and they're, they're democratizing the use of people's money to be able to initiate a whole spectrum of schemes in the UK, and they allow you to create an ISA. And they give you a good return on your basic ISA. It's, I think it's, I think it's about 3.54% on your on your basic ISA, even before you start investing into various different schemes. So you move money into your ISA, um, and then you can go, okay, well, there's a scheme up in Scotland which is taking the waste products from. The, the whiskey distillery business, and they're putting them into a biodigester, and then they're creating biomethane, and that's creating energy. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I'll put, you know, whatever it is, you know, 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds into that, and then there's some hydro scheme down in Swansea, which I get to put some money in, and then there's a community energy scheme, which is doing something around solar panels. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, this is incredible, because many of these schemes are offering you 7 or 8% per annum. I mean, they are. I mean, there's a lot of risk assertion behind some of those schemes, and they very much tell you this is pretty high risk investments. And there is one scheme which has moved my investments into shares, and that makes me feel very nervous. But it isn't a huge amount of money. I've kind of managed to basically invest in about six or seven of these schemes, and they've returned for me year on year for the last five or six years. And actually, any of the potential losses I've got left have all been covered by the interest which I've been, I've been paid. And I just think, you know, I get to do something great for the planet, and I'm making these active investments. And, you know, and I think I'm shaping the future world economy with my money. And I think that's the type of thing which I just, I just want to inspire people about. I think it's a good story to tell. It's a good story to tell about my pensions. I still have my money in NatWest. I'm going to move my bank probably next year or the year afterwards. But like, we all have some fallibility in this. It's not about saying that you can make things perfect, but it's about making things, as um, Seth said earlier on, you know, it's about trying to improve the, be, a lot of people taking slightly imperfect actions to be able to tackle this problem. Um, so yeah, that's my piece on on investments, and I'll, I'll pass over to the next panelist. Thanks very much, Tom, and it's uh, inspiring to hear that good investment, ethical investment, can also be good for us financially. And I'm going to hand over now to Jordan? Jero Jerome. Jerome. It's an unusual spelling. <laughs> Jerome, who's going to take us further on that journey. Thanks, Di. Um, if you were in the Netherlands, it wouldn't be unusual. That's okay. where I'm from. <laughs> Um, and thanks, Tom, for doing my job for me, because abundance and ethics are very much peers in that sector. Before I say anything else, I think Daniel has worked miracles to facilitate a very short uh, video. Thank you.
So earlier today, Steph said and referred to the use of personal resources to support the world we live in. And that's, that's why, we're here, why we're here. It's all about, it's all about money. So I've got a confession to make. In fact, I've got about three confessions to make. Um, unlike Tom, I spent 35 years engaged in one career, and I've now started a second career. The previous career was around money management. I worked in the city. I was a portfolio manager. And we used to invest in BP, in Shell, in Exxon, in Petrobras, in Sinook, in as many oil companies as you can shake a stick at. And I would do so with, with little conscience. And we invested in banks, we invested in armaments companies, everything. <clears throat> then about 10 years ago, the ESG, the environmental, social, and governance trend seeps into our industry. It came mostly from clients with a social conscience initially in Scandinavia. Reluctantly, we, we started to suit our products to suit these clients, and thus a theme, a trend was born. Um, you will sense from the sound of my voice that I was quite skeptical about it then, and I still am in terms of how this is implemented and how this is presented to, to you as um, pensioners, as investors. Um, anyway, this skepticism boiled over for me, so about five years ago, um, with disillusionment, frustration, I decided to chuck in um, on the face of it, a pers perfectly good career, and I decided to follow a two-year master's <coughs> in charity accounting and financial management. Within that course, by far the most compelling module for me was social investment. And social investment, bottom line, is sustainable investment in organizations that return a little bit of money but generate quantifiable and tangible impact. That led me through to picking up the phone or sending an email to a very impressive lead, uh, lady called Lisa Ashcroft who founded um, FX 10 years ago. Um, and she actually received um, an award for that earlier, earlier this year. So what is FX is very similar to what you described as uh, in abundance. Basically today, we've listened to some very impressive, very passionate practitioners in terms of where we want this world to, to head. But in practice, there are millions of people out there who are more passive, yet still positive in terms of that process. And they can be positive in terms of how they use their money. Now, you can choose, it, m money is all about a portfolio. You can have cash, you can have equities, you can have bonds. And yeah, you can choose, I mean, impact is very good, but a lot of ESG money out there, I think is a little bit suspect. They will describe themselves of e as ESG because they hold less than a certain benchmark or index in oil companies. Okay, so discuss. Um, in terms of ethics, you're talking about something completely different. You're not dealing with a portfolio that is anonymous, amorphous, and hard to touch. FX, as it has done over the last 10 years, funds specific projects which are on our website and are available to you, investors, because, because of their impact merits, first and foremost, and that's mainly what I do in terms of due diligence. We get tons of ideas every week sent in to us, only a few of which will go onto the website, primarily for their impact, but also, and this is what social investment is, it's an interplay between impact and financial returns. We have to form a judgment through analysis that these organizations are long-term financially viable. 
to both generate the impact and generate the return to you as investors. So I just want to give you one example. Over the last 10 years, we have helped fund 90 um, community renewable energy organizations. We have raised 80 million pounds in the process. Over that decade, those companies have returned 14 million aggregate in terms of interest back to the investors. So there you have the financial returns. But in my mind, much more importantly, we estimate that over the lifetime of all of those projects, and on aggregate, they'll average 20 to 25 years, 48 million pounds will be generated and donated to com specific community projects, be it to allevi alleviate rural poverty or to kickstart retrofit schemes. So just think, 80 pounds, and then you've got 14 pounds in interest, 48 million pounds to community projects. But then it's, it, this is all added up to about 120 megawatts sufficient to generate electricity for 40,000 houses. And I don't quite, I need to check these numbers, but apparently 700,000 tons of CO2 a year that is saved through these schemes. So you've got a brilliant example of impact and financial returns. So that is 80% of what we do is community renewables. Um, but actually, many of the things that we've heard about today, whether it's transport, I think Bridget mentioned go cars, um, we funded them. In Bicester itself, we funded Easy Charge. Um, food, sustainable farming is an important area for us. Um, uh, b b b circular economy. There's a stand over there. I forget what their name is, but they mention Library of Things, another organization that we've funded and is performing extremely well in terms of impact and in terms of financial returns. Um, look, I hope you get the picture. I could go on for ages. Um, there's a QR code over there. It's ethics.org.uk. Um, so by all means, have a look. It's all relatively easy. It doesn't require much money. You can start with 100 pounds. Um, and we're open to any questions. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Um, do we have any questions? Query, I don't know if anybody knows about the co-op bank, because they, they say they're ethical, um, but then I find they're owned by a hedge fund. So I don't know what money, where is that hedge fund money being invested? Um, and if anybody could enlighten me, um, I'd be grateful. Mine is a comment, really. Just to encourage you, switching your current account is really easy. I've done it from a high street bank to Nationwide, because they're the most ethical high street bank I could find. Very simple, and I would encourage you to give it a go. Just one quick comment. Um, I have three bank accounts. I won't go into why at the moment. One is with Triodos, another with Co-op. But just beware that they don't lend to personal borrowers. There are some catches with some of these banks. Um, so just, just one side of it. My, my question would be, though, um, the idea of dumping oil companies and other companies from our funds to become more sustainable in our investing, is it a good idea to just dump these just like that? Because... The problem I've heard is that the potential then is these companies are taken private and then as investors we have no, over, no oversight or control over what they actually do in the future. Uh, 
Um, I have a question about the insurance industry and reinsurance. Um, I've been reading recently that there's a an increasing concern in, these, um, uh, in the insurance business about the effects that we see already of climate change, whether it's flooding um, and the risk of properties, whether it's uh, fires, um, whether it's the loss of harvests. Um, and, well, the question is, what do you think is going to happen in this space? Um, and is it something that's going to have a, a long-term effect and, and how quickly might that happen? Thank you. I think we'll uh, go through those questions before we take any more. Who wants to go first? Jerome? Okay. Um, Co-op Bank, um, I think, is owned by a private equity company. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what else that private equity company um, gets up to. Um, private equity companies per se don't don't have to be a bad thing, but I would emphasise that the scrutiny, like any listed company now, you get their report and accounts out, and you get 20% of it is devoted to ESG, why they're good for the the planet, the environment. Private equity companies don't need to do that, so there is a bigger chance of something going wrong there than if it's all out in the open. That's all I'd say. Um, Triodos, not just because I'm Dutch, but I think they're a fantastic um, institution. They also do crowdfunding, a la FX, a la Abundance, so don't ignore them. Um, your question, we could spend two hours talking about that, because there are some schools of thought that say, don't just dump these, these names, but engage with them. And by engaging, they do change. And you know, I would note, and I'm not I'm just objectively, that Shell and BP are are spending a lot more on the development of renewable energy than some of their peers elsewhere in the world, where there is less scrutiny around them, and where arguably the money might go instead of. Shell and BP, so it's a very, very controversial area. Um, in terms of insurance, I'm not quite sure where this ends, but it's undoubtedly the case that there is increasing dispersion in premia. So I, I have a friend who lives in a floodplain in near Goring. Every year her, her land is flooded and her insurance premium are well, five times mine. In America, that's even worse. I have a friend who lives in Louisiana, and his premia are 10 times more than if you live a 1,000 feet up in Connecticut. So I'm not quite sure what happens there long term, but it's, it's a real problem. Thanks. I think those are um, great questions. I, I, I kind of want to, first of all, address the question about movement of money and influence on the big oil companies. Um, Christina Figueres, who was the architect of the Paris Climate Accord, in the last six months came out and said, oil companies, although I thought the oil companies were trying to be part of the solution, I am now entirely convinced that they are subverting action on climate change and restoration of nature. And that's a pretty big statement for someone who ran the UNF triple C debates in 2015 around the Paris Climate Accord as a massive statement. It's a massive statement to say those companies aren't helping. So I would say we are in the minority. There are a small number of very active investors who can actually change the dial on this. And I would suggest that moving money is one of the most active ways of doing that. In fact, during COVID, there was a lot of evidence which showed that, um, and not during COVID, during the Ukraine war, what happened was that there was a massive demand for, e for energy, and energy costs went up rapidly, right? We've seen energy costs go up rapidly. Um, and what that should have created was a massive, because still coal is, is, is a 
is a bit less expensive than offshore wind, um, still more expensive than solar panels, but is a very investable kind of solution and has a very historic record. What that should have meant was that the market should have created loads more coal factories, coal, coal power factories, and the coal investment should have gone that way. But actually what happened was because banks had made declarations that they were no longer going to invest in coal, there was n very little investment which got, m got moved into coal during the energy crisis. Now that's really important because we've got to see that transition. We've got to see these banks and these big financial institutions take a position in addition from just coal onto things like oil and maybe in a few years onto gas. Because unless we see that happen, then that's got to move. Now, I think one of the biggest ways of impacting that is to move your money. Um, but as you said, you can be very proactive as a shareholder within those things. But I think when those companies are actively trying to pull the wool over the eyes of both their shareholders and the public, and they are apps actively subverting action on these things, I think the best thing to do is just to pull your money out. So that's that's my position on 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 that on that aspect. Um, on insurance, there's loads of houses which are now becoming un, uninsurable, um, and it's it's just an incredible problem. Um, it's going to be an incredible problem for the UK economy. Our economy will fall because those value of those houses will fall off um, the value of our balance book. Um, we will become effectively a, um, you know, there will be more and more houses which will become uninsurable. And that's going to be a big problem in the US. Now, I think that's just, a pro that's just an aspect of the symptom of, of, of climate change. And, and there are ways in which we can arrest that problem. The ironic thing about it is that, you know, insurance companies are getting more and more proactive in this space. And they are getting, and they are measuring climate risk, and they are taking that into their considerations, and they are changing the way in which they do their insurance models. And we know that's happening at the moment, and we know that's going to affect the way in which insurance is delivered. Now, whether it makes things uninsurable or not is another matter, but it also will affect how insurance companies position their money because they hold huge reserves of money, and it will change how they invest. And that will be fundamental if we change the risk profile around our economy according to the climate impacts, then that will make a big change to the way in which we move our money. And if we start talking about things like nature positive and climate positive investments, um, then that can make a big difference. Now, I don't think that it's all bleak. In fact, I sit um, as one of my roles um, engaging the finance sector around nature-based solutions to climate change. You wouldn't believe it, but there's companies out there, BTG Pactual Bank, one of the, the, the biggest bank in Brazil, has got an arm of its, uh, its work, which is Timberland Investment Group. They are currently raising $1 billion. I feel like um, I'm Mike, Mike Powers, $1 billion, um, for, the, um, for the restoration of a million hectares in South America for reforestation. So there's a lot of positive things coming in the finance sector. It's just that money needs to move into those areas quite rapidly. And us as consumers or, or active participants within that money spectrum have a big part of that. In fact, companies hold quite a lot of money, but they are responsive to shareholders. But individuals, through their, through their pensions and all the rest of it, do hold the a big proportion of that. So what we decide to do, how we actively invest, will shape the future economy. And I think there's no doubt about that. So I don't think I've addressed the question over here um, about the co-op bank. But it's still to say that it's listed as a, a very ethical bank and that um, they, um, they still have a, a good ethical record in terms of carbon footprint and impact. I think on all the, the league tables I've seen, they, they rank pretty well. But um, there you go. Thank you. More questions? Yes, more, more questions. Um, I have a comment and a question. So uh, my comment is that um, I worked for the University of Oxford for 20 odd years, and so my pension was in the university's superannuation scheme. 
Um, and within the last couple of years, they've made it possible for employees to go into their account and um, choose the kind of investments they want their money to be in. Now, I don't know how much impact that has, but it's certainly an improvement. And I'm wondering whether other public sector pension schemes like the teachers scheme or the NHS might have similar options. Uh, my question was about banks again. How ethical are the, the new banks, you know, the ones that have no branches like Starling, the kind of online ones, are, are they getting any better? And I think we've got probably time for two or three more questions. Yes, gentlemen there. Thanks. If I can be cheeky, I've got two questions. One's, I suppose, structural and one's retail. So the structural question is really for Jeroen, I think. So when I've looked at some of the investment platforms, a lot of the investment opportunities seem to me community interest companies or smaller scale, particularly on energy production. Um, until recently, I was a um, cabinet member for finance in our local county council. And I often felt frustrated that the public sector, which is often doing quite a lot of good community stuff, funded by taxpayers, uh, but a lot of a lot of people's minds, government is inefficient, tax is a burden, uh, and it felt frustrating to me that it wasn't an obvious crossover between these projects. So I suppose my question is whether any of your bond raising and financing ever comes back directly to public sector organisations that are borrowing from you and from your investors, and whether there's more of a space for thinking differently about the interface between social enterprise and especially the local public sector when there's an opportunity there for investment that could be to mutual social benefit. So that's a structural question. The retail question's about kids' investments. So as someone who's trying to educate my kids in how their investment has an impact and having bought into lots of the principles you guys are describing, I find it really frustrating that lots of uh, the investment rules seem to prohibit children making the kinds of more ethical investments you're describing. They can have a, they can have a, you know, a, a bank account with a local branch but they can't hold a bond, they can't hold types of investments. So I just wondered if you had any advice other than just sort of engaging them in a conversation but effectively investing on their behalf, whether there's any other products out there that allow you to, your children, if they're lucky enough to have some savings or Christmas money from their grandparents, that they can actually put it into more ethical purposes than simply being with the co-op or another uh, regular savings account. Thanks. Lady over there on the left. Well, I've got a question. Perhaps we'll make this the last question. Speaking as uh, an older person um, and addressing it to Jerome, if I invested with ethics, what sort of time scale am I looking at? Before, what sort of time scale have I got to commit my money? I say, as an older person who never knows what's around the corner. Shall I try and hit some of the others yeah. as well? Um, the university superannuation question. Um, unfortunately, teachers and NHS don't have a pension fund that comes straight out of um, government budgets. So that's that's how I deflect that answer. Um, Starling, I don't know. Um, the question about, I guess, the overlap between what an FX does and public sector initiatives is a really interesting one. And as recently appointed lead development manager at FX, it's something where I'm confident we make a lot of progress over the next two years. I don't want to push competitors, but abundance already does a lot of work with, your nodding, so you probably know, with local authorities. And if you go onto their website now, there's some really attractive um, schemes whereby, um, you know, the crowd works together with local authorities to finance some very worthwhile projects. Um, in terms of kids, I share your frustration. So a year ago, I had a grandchild for the first time, and I struggled to find something that I could put in her name um, that would improve her world in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time. And what I've ended up doing is 
putting FX money into an account through her dad, which is really inefficient and imperfect. Time scale, um, if you go onto the FX website now, there'll be about seven and a half million pounds worth of projects across 10 specific projects in four different sectors. One might be a bond whereby you could get your money back, or you probably will get your money back, I've got to be careful how I say that, after five to eight years, and over five to eight years, you'll get paid six, six and a half percent, and if you're eligible, you could, you could make that ISA eligible. But then, specifically for some of the community renewables projects, there'll be withdrawable shares that where you won't get a capital return for 20, 25 years, but throughout that period, you might get paid five, six, seven percent a year. So that's, that's how I'd answer that. Anything to add to that, Tom? I mean, not much, but I mean, just to say, I mean, if you, if you made an investment in something like a bond, then that could be passed on. Um, and I think that's important to know that, you know, any investments you make in some of these, these mechanisms allows for it to be passed on. And it's really likely that those investments will give you a greater return than the current pension schemes, which seem to be limping along at the bottom. So, it, you know, I think liquidating that money is pretty difficult, maybe possible, but actually moving into some of these democratized systems is, is, is a really interesting thing to go about doing, and you can become quite an active investor. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's great. Um, I think that uh, the other points, I think you've covered quite nicely. Um, the only thing to say for me was that I've got the same problem. Um, in terms as, as Callum, in terms of my children, um, and I wrote to Abundance and was like, "Oh, can you set me up an ISA?" And they were like, "No." And then I spoke to my financial advisor, who set me up with Impacts, and I was like, "Can you set me up something which isn't invested in oil and gas and is going to be doing doing some good stuff?" And he said yes. And so I've got an ISA set up for my children now, which I pay into monthly, um, which is kind of tackling that. But I think you just need a financial advisor who's like a little bit more plugged in. Um, I mean, the financial advisor I use is plugged into St. James's Place, and I suppose they, they've just got a kind of wider group. There are actually f financial advisors which are very, very green, green focused as well, um, which can be probably quite helpful with that, with that problem. Um, so yeah, and I and 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 I think that um, you know yeah. So that's so that's my answer to those particular issues. Have I missed anything? Oh, Starling. I don't know. The thing I wanted to really say about this is look out for what banks are actively doing. I mean, I know Nationwide has recently released a um, allowing people to extend their mortgages in order to be able to retrofit their properties, and they're offering up to £15,000, which you can go about releasing, and they're, they're giving it a fixed rate in terms of, I think they're kind of capping it at like one and a half or two percent, which is like crazy in the kind of current financial circumstances. But you know, it's that type of progressive thinking from banks we really, really need in order to be able to stimulate a, an economy which is going to work for the masses and, and help us with the transition. Um, I don't think Starling has got a massive holding, has got the kind of weight of some of these organizations, but certainly what I've seen on some of the league tables and the such like is that these more progressive banks, which are attracting younger people, are taking a slightly more progressive approach to their investment strategies and therefore appear on all of these league tables as performing pretty well. Um, it's, it's, you know, when you think about this sector, I think it's easier to think about it of kind of going, okay, you've got a load of people in a bank who've been around in that bank and working in that bank 15, you know, however many years, 20, 30 years. And they have their built-up relationships. They have this understanding of trust between their, the people they're investing in. And they also have a risk appetite, which is tied to that historic kind of journey with them. So the reason why the big five banks aren't performing well is because they've been in the game for ages. And, they, and, they, and therefore, they respond to the things which have given them the returns. The, the, that's how they manage their risk. 
And actually, it's not like a fundamental choice that they're going to be destructive. It's just like it's a cultural, institutional, built-in kind of kind of behavior, which has just meant they keep on investing in the same people they've invested in for however many years. And what you'll find is that some of the more progressive banks or some of the newer banks will be taking a view on those things which doesn't have that history attached. And I think that's that's quite important when you think about like the the opposition to these things. I, I'm, I'm actually fairly post against postmodernistic thinking and sort of saying everything we've done is really is really bad. I think everything we've done up to now, um, everything we've done in the past is really bad, and what we're doing now is right, and what we do is going future is going to be right. I actually see that everything which we've done in the past has allowed us to build the thinking which helps us build for the future. It's just that there's some institutions which are still held in the past, right? And we need to be kind and forgiving to those institutions to help them move forward. And one of the ways I, I'm going to say is to do that is obviously to kind of promote some of the other active players so that they they start com out competing some of these organizations and allow them to start thinking in the same way in which they need to think um that's what will help them move forward um so yeah that's my those are my views on that well thank you all very much for your interesting questions we've covered an awful lot of ground and i certainly have achieved my objective of coming away better informed so thanks very much to Tom and Jerome and to Dan in his absence. Let's give them a round of applause.